，有请。左立教授在吗？啊，好的，嗯，呃，各位专家教授，大家上午好啊。下面我讲一下我这个呃可视化球囊辅助预期软件的手术的探讨。那么。软镜是做一期软镜还是做二期软镜？我想这是每一个这个做软镜的大夫都在思考的一个问题。那么一开始肯定大家开始做都是做二期的，但做做做做到后来，可能大家都想着能不能一起做，或者说至少部分病人一起做。那么我们也知道，国内很多大的中心，嗯，他们就坚持二期，但也有很多大的中心，他们就是呃会把大部分病人做一期。那么我们先来看一下，就是各大这个指南和这个对这方面的这个描述吧。嗯，我们看到这个国内的这个专家共识，他们没有硬性的规定说一定要做二期，就是预制这个双接管。那他只但是呢，他只说这个双呃预制之后它有一定的好处。那么 EAU 指南当中呢，也强烈的推荐，就是说预制这个支架管的话呢，它可以有利于提高这个软镜的呃这个一些好处。那么我们也知道，我们也刚开始做的时候肯定都是二期做的。那么做了做做做之后，我们发现患者肯定会向你抱怨说啊，这，呃，这留置支架管之后这个不好那个不好，呃，费用也多了，还要二次住院，尤其是现在有疫情，你每次住院，它是有些事情就更更加麻烦。所以在这个时候，我们也不得不思考一个问题，就是嗯、呃，能不能一起做？那么能不能一起做？那首先你做得到做不到？那么我们看一下国内的这个一些呃。大专家、他大的中心，他们做这个统计，其实一期软件的这个呃手术成功率呢，还是明显的要比二期的要低啊，低多少？大概就比百分之二十到三十这样一个比例。那么国外呢也有类似的这个呃研究，呃，他但是呢，他们认为呢，就是说预制管，就是做二期的话呢，它并不会主要影响这个呃绝食清除率啊，包括二次住院率和手术并发症，它只不过呢。会降低这个呃球囊扩张的这个术中球囊扩张的这个比例，以及一些比较严重的这个输尿管的损伤。那么这里就讲到一个球囊扩张的问题了。那么球囊扩张它会对呃这个造成一个什么样的？当然我们知道它肯定可以使输尿管变得更通呃并更通畅，但是呢呃球囊扩张它是不是会对输尿管造成一个远期的这样一个影响呢？那么至少这一篇文献里面呢。国外的一个研究上面，他是做的一个实验研究，他并没有发现，呃，有这个特别大的远期的这个并发症。那么我们也知道，就是我们之所以讲一期成功率或二期成功率，主要就是讲的一期的时候你智翘的成功率。那么大家知道智翘成功率它是有一定比例的，但是我们来看另外一个成功率，那就是球囊扩张的成功率。球囊扩张的成功率，就是你球囊把它扩张的这个操作能不能完成？这个完成的比例应该是比。比较高的，所以说这里就带来一个问题，就是说我们当把二期手术变成一期手术的时候，我们是不是能够通过球囊扩张这样一个简单的操作，或者说大家成功率比较高的一个操作，来弥补这个软镜翘没法上智的这样一个呃情况？那么这里呢，就是其实很我据据我所知，很多中心他们也在考虑这个问题，就是说。呃，利用一个直视的球囊扩张法，在一期软件呃手术当中的一个应用。那么我今天呢，并不想讲这样一个大的这个研究，因为这个研究很多中心正在探讨和这个刚刚起步阶段。那么我们是想做这样一个随机的前瞻性的临床对照研究，但是呢，我们还是这里讲我介绍的呢，是我们在这个研究之前，我们现在做了一个预试验。什么样的预试验呢？就是我们对于一期做。软镜的这部分病人，当发现上气号困难，或者说输尿管镜上镜困难的时候，我们并不是像常规的留置双接管之后两周之后再做，而是对这部分病人进行一个五毫米的输尿管球囊扩张，然后在扩张之后制翘，制十二十四 F 的翘，然后再做输尿管软镜。那么如果说我这个预试验能够一个比较好的结果的话，那么我想对于后面的实际对照研究会有一个好的铺垫。所以我现今天介绍的是这个问题。那么我们收集了二零今年以来吧，呃，大概有二十四例准备一期做，但是智翘困难或者说是输尿管上镜困难的呃软镜患者，我们做了一个这个呃分析。那么总共呢，在二十四个病人当中呢，这、就是他们的基线的这个情况。
。当然，我们首先要排除掉一些软呃这个呃不适合做软镜的这种病人啊。那我这就不多说了。那么我们使用输尿管软镜呃输尿管硬镜先观察这输尿管的条件，呃，然后留置导丝。那么如果我们在上镜的时候上输尿管硬镜的时候发现困难。或者说我们智翘的时候发生困难的话呢，那么我们在这时候就用了这个英诺韦的直视的这个五毫米的啊，注意一下这里是五毫米的，因为他们有七毫米的，是更大的，这里用的是五毫米，就最小号的一个球囊，做一个这个狭窄段的一个扩张。那么我们也这个这里有一段这个视频啊，这个患者呢是一个输尿管狭窄，他合并一个呃息肉啊，可能他的狭窄主要原因就是一个息肉的问题，那么。我们遇到这种情况，那么按照以往的经验呢，哦，我们可能就放一个双极管就结束，或者说再过一段时间再做了。那么这个病人呢，因为我们想用球囊试一下，所以这个病人我们就，我们再看一下，然后第二个我们就开始做这个球囊的扩张，因为他英诺韦的这个五毫米的球囊呢，我觉得有两个特点，第一个呢是直视下啊，因为目前为止呢，就是说你能在。这个硬镜的监视下做这个扩张，看扩张全过程的这种球囊，应该还是国内市场上不多的。那么第二个呢，它这个球囊的口径比较小，是五毫米的。五毫米的它其实对输尿管，它只是起到一个让你这个软镜呃呃软镜鞘能够通过这样一个目的。我并不需要呃撕裂它的这个基层或者说更深的层次，去起到一个这个长期扩张的这个作用。那么。大家看，这个是已经这个撑起来了，知道吧？这已经撑起来了。那么这个撑完了之后啊，撑完了之后，我们来再来看一个。啊，就刚才大家对比一下，从最开始就是说，基本上就起原本完全看不到，现在扩张之后，你看我们其实可以看到这个输尿管，呃，这个近端的这个全长都可以看到啊，所以。这就是一个直视球囊的一个好处，啊，那么在这个球囊辅助的这个之后呢，我们这下子就放翘就很很方便了，啊，所以这个病人就是这个教育过程之后，就把一个本来需要放双极管的，就变成了一个这个一期一期手术。那么当然更多的呢，是我们遇到的呢，是一些就是在输尿管的下端的一些输尿管下端的一些狭窄。的病人，这部分病人，这部分病人呢，就是我们需要对对对他这个输尿管的下端进行一个扩张，他可能有的时候是一个角度的问题，有的时候是一个，呃，是一个狭窄的问题，你连硬镜都进不去，或者说硬镜都很勉强进去，那么智翘就更加困难，而且，呃，我们怕智翘也造成这个输尿管下端的损伤。那么先做一个，呃，五毫米的扩张之后，我们可以发现啊，就是其实他。最后，它的你看它的管腔并没有受到很大的这个损伤，但是它的扁管腔被扩扩张了，被扩张了。那么我们分析一下，大概这个病人其实他的手术时长啊，包括这个血色素的下降啊，以及住院的时长啊，呃，基本上都是还是我们在能接受的范围内。那么费用呢，可能有一个球囊的费用是会有点增高，侵蚀率呢？也是跟这个二期是大概差不多的，当然我这个不是一个对照研究啊，所以我没有拿出这个对照的数据。那么但是呢，也发现了一些问题，比如说这个呃发热率。那么我们以前做软镜这么多年下来，做一个总的是发热率大概在百分之十左右，啊，有的时候在百分之十以下。那么这个呢，稍微要稍微高一点，大概百分之十二点五。那么这个也是可以接受的。那么并发症当中，我们这二十四例当中有一例患者呢出现了这个肾周的血肿。啊、呃，但是呢，经过保守治疗之后呢，这个患者也顺利的出院了。所以说，呃，虽然我们可以这么做，但是我觉得我们也要，呃，有一个这样的，呃，脑子里有一个这样的警惕，就是说，一旦有可能发生这个一些并发症的这个。那么总的来讲呢，我觉得就是说，通过我们这个预试验，临床的预试验，我们觉得可视化球囊辅助扩张来达到二期手术变成一期手术这样一个目的呢，它的安全性和有效性呢是可以期待的，是可以期待的。所以呢，我在这里呢，我也很期待有一个这个多中心的，呃，一期的治效困难的软镜患者，针对这部分患者呢，有一个一期球囊扩张和一个二期预置管扩张这两个随机对照的研究。如果我们多中心的研究把这个大数据拿出来的话，可能对我们以后呃一期的选择和二期的选择，我们临床的泌尿科医生也不那么纠结了啊。那么我的汇报就到这儿，谢谢大家。好，我们非常感谢。
。下面有请我们这个讨论嘉宾李梦强教授在吗？李梦强教授在吗？在那个啊，樊松教授你好，嗯、我刚刚看到这个手机教授的汇报，我觉得非常好。因为不管是肿瘤手术啊，是吧，还是切除手术，呃，应该说这几年进步这么大，主要还是依赖于这个器械的进步，是是，其实是起了一个引领的作用啊。我们人的技术是跟着器械的技术走的，是吧？所以说这种可视化的这种球囊这种扩张是其实是把二期的能变成一期的，那当然是非常好了，是吧？我们换位思考一下，如果我们自己是病人的话，我们肯定也希望时间短短的一期就做掉是最好的了，是吧？所以说这个应该是是是非常好的。其实费用增加的也不会太多，并且你二期的话，再加上中间两周，那又耽误工作啊，好多东西，那个可能潜在的费用我们就不好说了，是吧？可能还比这个更高，所以我说这个是非常好的一个一个一个改进。好的，我我就说这么多哈，反正教授好，谢谢谢谢，谢谢嗯，谢谢。我们有请江华教授，江华教授在吗？谢谢李梦强教授，江华教授在吗？江华教授。李生华教授在吗？李生华教授，哎，在在在在在。您您先点评吧，江华教授可能好的走开了。好的，好的确实谢谢确实，我们左教授介绍的这个球囊，我们也在用。呃，确实它能提高我们这个输尿管软件一期的这个治疗的成功率。但是我们也在治疗的过程发现，这种不管是我们治疗产生的这种损伤，还是这种呃球囊扩张产生的损伤，有一部分病人。术后出现这个输尿管这种狭窄啊，或者整个输尿管的僵硬，啊，导致术后的排屎很困难，啊，所以我们虽然讲这个球囊确实提高了我们这个治疗的成功率，但是呢，这个出现的问题可能也是我们要思考的，啊，呃，我们确实碰到很多病人啊，做了以后扩张了以后，或者说是在术中有损伤以后，发现术后输尿管僵硬，僵硬的很厉害。那么它这种输尿管变僵硬，然后术后的排石是个很大的问题，啊，这是我提的一点问题，好吧，谢谢。好，李教授，请左立教授回答，我、嗯、们。左立教授、啊这个、就是哎对，因为我们其实现现在还并不是说要一个呃得出一个结论，其实我这个研究只不过是想引出一个，就是说将来是不是大家能够就是比如说我们轻微啊，或者我们做结石。呃，这帮人啊，能够大家做一个多中心的一个对照的研究，就是来看一看，如果说我们做一个一期的呃球囊扩张这些这个治疗困难的这部分病人的话，会不会有一个远期的呃，因为我们现在所有的经验都是基于自己的单中心的，可能是个呃个别案例的，那所以说如果我们有这样一个机会啊，就是说比如说在我们轻微的这个呃大家一起的这个串联起来的话，做一个大数据的。呃，分析做一个前瞻性的临床对照研究的话，我觉得这个会有更大的说服力，也对我们未来有更多的指导。好嘞，非常谢谢左。我最后一次呼叫江华教授在吗？江华教授，江华教授可能走开了。那么我就把下一节的主持，把我们主持交给崔振宇教授。崔振宇教授在吗？崔振宇教授，呼叫崔教授。崔教授在吗？哎，能听见吗？啊，对，崔教授，您在吗？在呢。哎，是这样吗？对，我把那个主持交给您了。好，谢谢。嗯，辛苦您，辛苦您。给教授的这个分享啊，由于时间关系呢，咱们直接进入下一个环节，就是下一个讲题。有请胡浩教授给咱们带来输尿管狭窄的内镜下治疗现状与未来。有请胡教授。呃，谢谢崔教授啊，呃，能听见吗？啊，呃，各位呃，尊敬的各位呃，我们学组的领导啊，我们各位青年同道，呃，线上线下的青年朋友，大家中午好啊。呃，今天我一点时间跟大家聊一下输尿管狭窄的内镜下治疗，这个题目有点大啊，呃，大家别介意啊，有什么问题咱们也可以线上线下沟通。那么其实就是对我这两年关于输尿管狭窄内镜下治疗的一点总结吧。那么时间的关系，我尽量把这个，呃，重要的内容啊信息传递给大家。那么狭窄的问题，我想，呃，我们通过这个病因可以看到啊，医源性的损伤啊，医源性的一些病因和肿瘤啊，是我们目前狭窄其实最主要的原因啊，先天性的啊这种反而比较少了。那么对于这种狭窄的传统治疗方式，我们一个是重建的手术。一个是这些年做的越来越多的这种内镜下的治疗，那么
标准依然是重建的手术啊。我们为什么把它作为金标准？因为它的治愈率更高啊。但是我们要想一下，为什么我们会把内镜下治疗的越来越多呢？因为很多病人他做不了重建的手术啊。所以呢，其实我们对于这个标准的评价啊是有一定的问题的。那么，因为我们是以治愈为标准进行评价的啊。那么，所以呢，我想跟大家说的第一个问题就是。我们对于输尿管狭窄的治疗目标啊，我的体会应该有分成两个目标。第一个目标呢是以治愈性治疗为目的的目标，第二个呢是以维持性治疗为目的的目标。那么为什么这样说呢？因为很多病人啊，他确实做不了这种以治愈性治疗为目标的这样手术啊。这些原因影响因素很多了，我就不多说了。我们再来看一下这个表啊，我们真正有多少个病人，我们有多大的把握能让病人有一个治愈性的一个治疗的结果？啊，所以呢，我个人认为，对于输尿管狭窄的维持治疗，其实在临床中的需求更大。那么，由于我们在以往，我们以治愈性治疗为目标的这种标准，它低估了内镜下治疗的效果。啊，这是我对这个问题的理解。那么，怎么能什么样的因素会影响内镜治疗的效果呢？一个是做内镜下的狭窄的处理，那么另外一个呢就是腔内的支撑。那么。狭狭窄的处理，我们可以用球囊，可以用激光啊，或者用单极，甚至有剪刀啊。那么腔内的支撑，我们最多用的是双珠尾。那么近年来还有些腹膜支架啊。那么我们可以看看，什么样的病人，我们如何能达到最好的治疗效果？我想在以前啊，我们讨论的很多的是，啊，作为怎么去处理，是用电刀啊，是用激光啊，还是用球囊啊？其实现在还有新的好武器啊，我们有这种腹膜支架啊，所以我。通过这些年的这个这两年的这个经验吧，啊，如果我们有一个充分的一个扩张啊，对狭窄的处理加上我们有效的支撑，我相信会达到一个更好的治疗效果。但依然是这种治疗效果，我们要给它分成治愈性的目标还是维持性的目标。那么对如何进行扩张啊，我个人更推荐这种球囊啊，除非这种连接部的我们这种扩张效果不好的，我们可以用内切开啊。但是其他部位的狭窄，我们大多数可以都通过球囊来扩张。那么它需求很多，它自己相对于这个内切开啊、激光这样的优势，那么比较重要的长段的狭窄啊，我们能切的扩张的口径更大，还有呢，它这种高的这种镜像力啊，会达到一个更好的效果。那么支撑，我认为同样的重要啊，就像我们去建个隧道啊，我们可以用各样的各种各样的武器啊，把这个隧道打通。我相信这不是艰难的事那么当然，我们也同时需要一个好的支撑，才让这个。隧道畅通无阻，那么，所以我就把我们这两年关于球囊加腹膜支架的一个维持性治疗的一个结果，还有我们治愈性治疗的结果，给大家汇报一下啊。那么，之所以先说维持性治疗啊，我们把收集的数据呢是到去年年底的，因为我觉得只有随访时间超过一定，才能说明这个维持性治疗是有效的。那么，这是我们做的，去年年底为止，一共八十六个病人啊。平均随访的时间在十四个月啊，超过一年了啊，所以我们可以拿出来跟大家共享了啊。那么从病因上来看，我们看最多的还是医院性的一个问题啊。呃，我们看结果啊，这些病人呢，手术我觉得对于狭窄的治疗、内镜下的治疗，其实它手术难度并不是很大啊。那么但是呢，我们也要注意他的手术并发症的问题，比较常见的并发症啊，术后的发热啊。但是呢，这种发热大多数，只要我们在术前控制好的话，一般不会有太严重的感染的出现。那么术后的疼痛比较多见，因为我们有穷囊扩张了啊，很多尤其放疗的病人，他疼痛会很明显。那么在十四个月的平均十四个月的随访结果，我们来看一下啊，术前的这个，我们先评价肾功能，我们看一下血肌酐啊，是有一个明显的差异的。那么怎么看剩余的这个缓解率啊，狭窄的通畅率？我们主要看一下平剩余的宽度啊。那么很遗憾，我们没有所有的病人都在做肾动态，但是现在正在收集这样的数据。另外，我觉得很重要的，想跟大家传递的信息呢，就是关于生活质量啊。那么我们以前很担心的就是低支管的病人，他生活质量的影响。但是这些病人我们可以看到，他的这个生活质量是明显的提高的啊。那么有没有问题？呃，当然是有问题的啊，并不是所有的病人都能达到一个很好的结果。我们刚才提到的这种通畅性有百分之九十四啊，就大部分的病人随访一年以上都是没有问题的。那么剩下的这些病人有什么问题？最常见的啊，当然还是有病人个别病人会有症状，但是这个症状和我们长期那些不能耐受的病人还是不能无法相比的。我们只有很多放低支管的病人来找我们，他真的是觉得这个低支管根本就没有办法带了啊。
但是对于腹膜支架植入以后呢，大部分的病人他只是有一些轻微的症状啊。那么其他的并发症，比如说继发段呃继发性的狭窄、支架的移位、结壳，偶尔能够碰到，但主要集中在特殊的病例啊。需要跟大家说的一个是连接部狭窄处理，这个做过成型手术的。容易出现这种支架的移位，另外呢，就是放疗的病人容易出现感染和结合结结鞘。那么用简单的几个病例跟大家回顾一下，我们最长的几个病人啊，呃，这是一个呃孤立肾的病人，输尿管下段长短的狭窄，原来每年都要做这个呃定期的更换。那么这个病人随访二十四个月啊，孤立肾，他现在肌酐比较稳定，肾盂的宽度啊也比较稳定，关键是他的。在这两年的时间内，没有一次发烧啊！他以前带滴滴管，带两根滴，一侧带两根滴滴管，经常会出现感染的症状，没有这种尿路刺激的症状啊！他这种截瘫的病人表现尿路刺激症是一种下腹的不适啊。那么这是一个回肠膀胱门合口狭窄的病人啊，确实在重建手术比较难啊。但是我们做完以后随访两将近两年的结果，也是非常好啊，没有支架的移位和脱落啊。这是我们觉得对腹膜支架非常有意义的一个人群啊，就是。放疗后的病人啊，很多放疗的病人都是在留置长时间留置输尿管支架以后，出现了肌酐的进行的升高，反复的发烧，不断的缩短这种更换支架管的频率。但是我们做的第一个多根支架植入的这个放疗的病人，他在做完以后，现在随访的时间二十个月啊，肌酐稳定啊，因为他之前已经慢慢的升到四百多了啊，现在肌酐稳定啊，没有出现这种相关的一些并发症的发生啊。那么这里特殊要提一下放疗的病人啊，放疗病人是我们做腹膜支架中出现问题最多的啊。那么需要手术，我们最需要关注的就是我们要很好的扩张，因为这是个很矛盾的问题啊。因为它长段的狭窄，狭窄段很严重，我们必须要一个好的球囊。这个好的球囊，没有足够的压力的话，是不能够把这个狭窄段扩张开的。那么而且这种扩张的，这个直径，我认为越大越好。因为腹膜支架它没有足大足够大的力量把这个狭窄扩开，它需要在球囊的扩张的基础上把它扩开。第二个呢就是长度啊，我们一般的球囊现在都六公分长，但是巴德的二十一 F 的球囊它有个十公分的，特别好用啊。那么如果对于超过二十公分的这个狭窄的话，如果用短球囊可能要三到四次才能把它扩开，但是我们用十公分的球囊两次就扩开了，大大的缩短了手术的时间，提高了手术的效率啊。那我们再说一下治愈性治疗啊，为。虽然我们现在治愈性的治疗不是有非非常多的病例啊，但是我觉得这应该是我们将来内镜下治疗的一个希望啊，也是我们将来的一个比较好的一个方向吧。为什么呢？因为以前我们在重视更多的关注点都在扩张切开，但是现在如果有一个很好的支撑的情况下，可以让它这个下软呢长得更好啊。我们这是一个呃江西的病人，就是一个输尿管短断的一个狭窄，呃。他在了两次球囊扩张都没有成功啊，那么后来做了一次腹膜支架，结果这病人半年的时候支架管自己掉出来了啊，当时我们紧也挺紧张啊。我们想想，之所以他会掉，为什么会掉出来啊？还是因为他管壁的压力减少了啊，所以我们当时就跟他说呀、啊，你就先复查超声看看啊。这病人后来随访，积水基本上消失了，就他的他的下水段基本上也算治愈了啊。那么这。关于其实呃这种腹膜支架治疗输尿管狭窄的支撑性治疗呢，其实文章不是很多啊。这是去年耶优的一个意大利的学者，他做了三十八例啊。他怎么做呢？就是所有的病人都是植入腹膜支架以后半年拔除，他想看一下多少个病人能达到治愈的效果。他在他的文献呃报道中有百分之七十三的结果啊，那就是说明对于短暂狭窄，我认为还是有治愈的希望的啊。那么这些呃没有治愈的病人，他都做了，后来又做了成型手术。所以我们可以给这种病人一个内镜下治疗的机会。那么另外一个很好的腹膜支架的适应症呢，是关于输尿管阴道漏的啊。那么这是一个病人反复做手术，包括开放的，包括这种内镜下他都处理过。我们给他放了腹膜支架以后，第二天，啊，漏尿就消失了，彻底的改变了他生活。两年的漏尿消失啊，而且，他，这个支架脱落以后也把，就是在半年以后拔掉了啊，支架拔掉以后，没有再复发漏尿。另外一个很重要的，其实我估计李军教授原来在我们院做很多这种病人啊，我们漏输尿管漏的病人，我们一个是担心他漏，其实还有一个担心就是他窄啊。这个病人没有漏的同时，也没有再出现窄的问题啊。那么这关于漏的问题，这个意大利学者也报道了，他三例堵漏的病人全都成功了啊。所以简单总结一下，啊，我们在现有的这个基础上，如果有一个很好的扩张，加一个很好的支撑。
，应该对于维持性治疗是一个更有效的一个方法。那么对这些特殊的人群，我相信是一个更有前景的方法。那么对于治愈性的治疗，我需要，我觉得需要我们更多的去探索啊，什么样的病人适合治愈性的治疗？我相信一定有这样的病人适合治愈性的治疗。谢谢大家。感谢胡浩教授的这个精彩分享。下边有请胡卫国教授。呃，谢谢胡浩教授精彩的讲座。因为咱们知道，呃，咱们在座的这些学专家，他们大多啊，但是呢，他们在学习治疗方面呢，很少狭窄，呃，这个非常难处理，经常呢还出错。呃，我听不到，啊，要不你用我的说吧，来这说吧。啊，为什么崔教授说能听到，我说的特别听不到呢？<笑>啊，现在能听到是吧？啊，我就占用这个主讲的位置啊。呃，刚才胡教授说讲的非常精彩，咱们做结石专家很多啊，但是咱们做结石专家都知道，输血管狭窄是很难处理的一个问题，特别是长段的复杂的狭窄。呃，是非常棘手，愿意搞的专家也特别少，做的好的专家也特别少。这抚摸支架呢，它确实给咱们提供了一个非常好的一个呃呃工具啊、呃。因为时间关系也不多讲，但是我觉得胡教授讲的非常好。对于维持的治疗呢，呃，实际上它大家可以呃一目了然，它肯定是一个非常好的工具。呃，一个是长，它可以处理一些长段狭窄；呃，再长的狭窄呢，两两个支架也可以解决。它最长一年到三年的。维持时间肯定是比长期更换普通滴滴管要好得多。呃，第二呢，我们其实更期待这个呃第二种治疗目标，是治愈性呃治疗。啊、呃，这个也期待咱们胡教授后期的一些研究成果。呃，因为时间关系呢，呃就不多讲。呃，有请后面的讨论专家啊、呃、进行点评。好，感谢胡伟哥教授的这个讨论。下边有请王宝龙教授。谈谈您的看法。嗯哎，刚才这个呃，胡浩的发言收获很多啊。另外呢，就是说，呃，现在这个安里姆支架、腹膜支架成为这个输尿管狭窄治疗的一个非常好的一个手段。那么，呃，现在呢，也有好多病人呢因此而受益。那么，有稍微一个小问题，就是说，对于这个安里姆支架。呃，治疗输尿管阴道漏，那么是什么样的情况可以采取？是这种呃输尿管的一个小小这种冻状的缺失，还是这种输尿管的有这个这个断裂以后这种阴道漏，是不是可以采取这个安利姆之下的治疗？嗯嗯，好，谢谢王教授啊，我简单的说，那么这个其实我觉得这两种情况都可以用啊，那么怎么用？呃，我觉得对于堵漏。呃，小的漏口，我们用输尿管肯肯定是应该是可以堵住的。那么，但是问题在哪儿？对于这种断开的啊，断开的病人，我觉得漏应该是没问题的啊。但是我怕的是将来的狭窄，对，因为呢，这种病人我们知道大多数都是骨科呀、骨伤的一些大的手术引起的。对于主管医生来说，他更需要的是一个治愈性的结果。所以，对于断的病人啊，我更建议，如果能一起手术最好啊，因为你同样同时解决漏的问题，还能同时解决窄的问题。但是小的漏口，如果它窄的概率不是很高，我建议可以直接选用这个腹膜支架堵，对吧？但是如果说这个断开的病人时间已很久了，那根本就不能做直线手术，那根本就不能做直线手术，那么可以做这种腹膜支架的手术。啊，但是跟病人的预期要把狭窄的概率交易交代到。那么另外呢，自己这个我们对这个病人将来的这种患家的可能都要说说清楚啊。那么有人把国外的教授啊，把这种手术叫 bridging 啊,啊搭桥。桥接。嗯嗯嗯。好，非常感谢胡教授。嗯。感谢宝龙教授的讨论啊。谢谢教授。谢谢教授。哎，请您做一个这个简短的讨论。好嘞，那个首先这个感谢这个学组各位领导给我们搭建的这个学习交流的平台啊，呃，也非常感谢胡浩教授做了一个非常精彩的这个报告
，每次听胡教授的报告，都能有更多的思考和学习这个东西。呃，这个中药管狭窄，确实是我们泌尿科这个治疗一个比较棘手的问题。呃，这个胸囊扩张和这个腹膜支架呃出现呢，就是对对于这个中药管狭窄的腔内治疗，确实是非常有益处。呃，有一个小的问题，这个这个向那个胡教授请教啊，就是刚才讲了这个从维持治疗我们就不说了啊，对于这个以后的这个治愈治疗，当然也要根据以后病人的这个随访和这个情况看。我想问一下，呃，那么刚才胡胡教授也提到，这个比较短的可能治愈性的希望会更大。那么我知道这狭窄它有很多的原因，包括你像放疗对吧，还有一些腔内结石术后的，还有一些等等的原因，就在这些不同的这个。呃，病因的情况下，呃，胡教授有没有就是呃体会，就哪一种因素可能在治愈性的效果上可能会更好呢？谢谢啊，谢谢啊，呃，我我现在的体会啊，就是我们有两个病人都达到了治愈效果，但这两个病人都是一样的啊，因为我们这种支架我们不敢给他轻易的拔，因为毕竟比较贵嘛，病人戴着也挺好，为什么要给他拔呀？对，这两个病人都是支架进行脱落。好吧，能听见吧？啊，所以两两个病人的支架都是自行脱落的啊。说明这两个病人也都是输尿管狭窄术后的病人，都是短断的狭窄。那么第二个呢，就是我觉得，所以将来短断的狭窄这种良性就是术中损伤的这种病因，我觉得应该是有希望的。但是对于放疗、肿瘤压迫，尤其是放疗啊，我基本上没有见过放疗短断狭窄的，都是长断的啊，甚至都是二十将近二十公分长的，我们都见到。呃，大部分都是超过十公分的，所以说呢，这种病人我觉得希望基本上是可以，呃，应该是很低的。所以这种短断的，呃，比如良性的手术的病因啊、呃，呃，或者是连接部的成型，我将来是有可以可以我们去探索的。好的，谢谢胡教授。谢谢。好的，好的，感谢这个胡教授和三位这个点评专。<咳>陈奇教授在吗？我在。哎，有请陈奇教授。哎，我换了个电脑，刚才啊，说话说不清。不好意思，我那个视频视频打不开，我只我只能讲，也看不到我人了，可能只能黑屏了。好的，麻烦您共享屏幕吧。好，啊，谢谢。好的，呃，各位领导、各位教授，大家中午好。那么今天我想跟大家分享的题目呢是套式栏在输尿管软禁术术当中的应用。那么其实这个题目呢也不是一个非常非常新颖的题目了，因为我们知道我们例行的进人体自然腔道的术术手术呢已经被广泛接受。那么我们可以做非常多的手术，呃，类型来清除各种上尿路结石，通过软禁，通过硬禁。那么，但是我觉得，呃，作为一个医生来讲，我们还是要以患者为中心，有一个人文的关怀。那么，我们知道软禁呢，呃，在肾结石的治疗当中呢，已经具有了潜在的替代体外冲击波跟经闭肾镜的潜力。但是呢，如果对于两公分以上的肾结石来讲呢，它的清除率还是会低于经闭肾镜的。那么，所以我觉得在治疗的选择之前呢，患者我们应该被充分的告知。各种治疗的利弊，包括药物治疗、体外冲击波、输尿管镜、软镜、呃经皮肾镜，包括开放手术以及腹腔镜机器人手术。那么让病人呢，呃，做一个个体化的治疗方案的选择。那么，因为今天我软禁的细节问题不太想展开讲，那么我但我想提一个呢，因为跟我们套食栏有关系的一个内容，那么也就是手术当中的体位。呃，在我们中心呢，我们一般是采取一个改良的 c h a d l e n b u r g e s 的呃体位。来，希望这个结石呢尽量不要进入下展，呃，来往中上展走。那么这样的话呢，其实呃会呃减减少我们套式栏的使用。那么从一个手术的顺序来讲，呃，我们
呃做软件的话呢，我建议大家是先呃有一个整体的观念，就像我们做一个膀胱肿瘤电器。切一样，我们进去之后不是看到一个肿瘤切，呃，我们应该整体的了解一下这个集合系统的解剖，以及明确一下结石的分布情况，然后制定一个整体的治疗策略，那么然后再去处理这个呃结石。那么时间关系我就不讲。那么现在一个非常有有热点或者有争议的问题呢，到底我们应该是呃粉末化碎石还是碎块化碎石？那么我觉得呢，呃，我们应该根据以下这些情况来做一个判断，首先是结石的情况。那么我们要根据结石的成分啊，它的结构、它的硬度以及位置，那么来去呃做一个具体化的选择。那么到底是先碎块化呢，还是先粉末化？那么我觉得，如果是一个结石并不是太大的话呢，我觉得我们应该呃先碎块化，然后把一个结石打成若干个小碎块之后呢，快速的取出。那么这样的话呢，结石取精率会更高一点。那如果碰到一个比较大的结石呢，我建议可能我们先可以先考虑先粉末化碎石。那么到达到一个结石的硬的核心的时候呢，我们再把它碎块化取出。那么激光能量的设定，那么我们每个医生都有自己的各自的经验。另外呢，我觉得很重要一点，我们尽量的把结石呢移位到上展或者中展的碎石。那么这样的话呢，就效率会更高，取石会更方便。那么也对软径呢有一个非常好的保护。那么如果对一个大负荷的结石，我觉得我们在击碎之后呢，避免把这个结石移到单一的一个渗展。呃，我觉得可以把它分别移到几个我们软径能够方便进入的渗展。那么这样的话呢，呃，避免在一个呃一堆结石碎屑当中，隐藏了某些结石碎块。那么这样的话呢，可以大大提高我们的结石清除率。那么因为我在我们中心做手术的话，软径基本上会取精结石。那么这样的话呢，对患者的一个结石清除率来讲是会更好。那么术后的话，我们可以做。呃 ，stentless， 也就是做不放呃底接管，那么让病人有个更好的就医体验。所以我觉得提高侵蚀侵蚀效率呢，是呃减少并发症的非常重要的一环。那么我们怎么样子来选择合适的套死栏呢？其实我们呃在目前我们常用的有三丝啊、呃、四丝，包括一些呃呃像降落伞状的套死栏，那么它各有利弊。像四丝套死栏的话呢，它主要我觉得是。移位结石会比较方便，因为它可以抓取比较大的结石，可以把一些下展或者一些偏偏的角度的展结石呢移位到我们能够触及或能够击打的地方。那么另外四四的话呢，因为它可以在展内形状可以。陈奇教授，你好。陈教授，我们听不听不见了？陈奇教授，哎，您您那是网络是不？陈奇教授，陈奇教授听得见吗？中了，陈奇教授。
。哎，陈奇教授，陈奇教授，好，感谢陈奇教授的精彩报告啊。由于网络的问题，后边可能这个音频有点问题。呃，下边有请这个三位讨论嘉宾啊，赵有光教授在吗？赵教授。赵有光教授在吗？那下边先有请这个肖晶教授，给咱们做一个点评。哎哎，各位同道啊、呃，大家中午好。呃，刚刚听了一下陈曦教授的这个呃发言哈，因为前前半部分呢都是有幻灯有。有说话到后半部分呢，我们基本上是在观看他的幻灯，但是呢，意识也大概明白。呃，我觉得他前面讲的还是很有很好的。这个对于输尿管软件取食，其实是一直我们做手术要面临的一个问题。啊、呃，仁济医院这个、呃、陈教授给我们做了一个很好的一个讲解。其实我们日常工作当中，我本来想问问陈教授，什么因素是影响我们术中做出判断是否取食？的一个一些考量因素，啊，呃，陈立教授可能听不到，<笑>听不到呢，我讲讲我自己的一些看法吧。就是做软件要不要取食，什么时候取，啊，取多少，我觉得可能是都是我们每一次手术当中要考虑的问题。呃，我觉得有这么些因素会影响我们的术中的一些一些考量哈。第一个石头的大小和硬度方面来看呢，如果这个石头是二水草二二水的啊，这个很容易就粉末化了。啊，有的时候可能就不一定要取了，但是一水的时候呢，特别硬的时候呢，很难粉末化，只能颗粒化或者碎块化的时候呢，那么这种情况下呢，呃，可能需要取出来，这样呢会提高一个进食率。第三个呢，做比较大的石头的时候，啊，这种两公分以上的时候呢，呃，为了减少术后的石阶的发生，啊，提高侵蚀率的情况下呢，呃，防止术后的石阶，我想呢，这样可能，费一些时间，把石头取出来，呃，也是有必要的。当然了，整体来说，所有的结石手术、结石的成分分析，就相当于我们做肿瘤的肿瘤的病理分析一样，按理说是都是应该的啊，应该要有结石的成分分析，这样呢，呃，是才是个更完整的一个一个手术。那么，除去本结石本身的因素是影响我们术中做出策略判断是否需要取石之外呢，我想呢，还有一些别的因素会影响我们做出抉择要不要取石，比如说输尿管的条件。你放气翘的长度和深度，如果说输尿管的条件不好，我们的翘放的位置不会很好，放在中下段，或者呃前面有狭窄环，你反复的取石套石，其实有可能都会对输尿管造成损伤，会刮伤这个输尿管黏膜。那么这种情况下呢，你可能就取一个或两个，能够画一下结石就够了，剩下的结石尽量给它粉末化或者颗粒化，不要存留大块的，啊，那么是输尿管的条件的问题。那么，还有一个因素影响呢，我们是否取石，就是我们手头有没有好的工具。刚刚其实陈教授和我们讲了，介绍了很多取石工具，啊，呃，有反复复用的，有多次使用的，有一次性使用的。那么有好的工具，啊，可能决定我们去试一试。如果没有好的工具，或者说病人的经济条件也是影响我们考虑是否取石的一个因素，以及病人是不是在城里或者农村很偏远的地方，啊，他是不是方便来复诊，是不是方便来排石。啊，输尿管的条件，如果经济条件不是很好，那么可能是就给他打了粉末化一些，让他自己排吧。啊，如果经济条件好，我们可能取一些出来化验，对患者也有利。我想呢，这也是影响我们是否取食的一个综合判断的一些考一些考量的因素。但是总的来说，是否取食，我觉得还是真的是要综合来考虑啊，尤其是在我们碎石过程当中，经常会考虑这个石头。你把它打成十个啊，三毫米、四毫米的，还是打成三个，这个五六毫米的取出来，其实是根据施工情况要综合考虑的。当然了，工艺上其实必先利其器，各家公司提供的这种优质的这种取石的工具，对我们手术有很大的帮助。那么结合患者的情况、结石的情况，做出一个综合判断，我想呢，也是我们结石大夫应该综合考虑的一些因素。好的，谢谢陈曦教授的这个介绍。谢谢谢谢，能听到吧？谢谢，现在听到了。<笑>不好意思，不好意思，刚才我在我在今天我们在手术室里面，有的时候信号会差一点，不好意思。好，呃，感谢陈曦教授啊，感谢肖晶教授的这个分享。王福利教授在吗？在。
，哎，徐教授，有有请您那个给我们做做点评。好，谢谢呃，徐教授，呃，学习了陈陈教授这个讲课、啊，收获很多啊，就说掏出来就叫很多，因为咱们做都是做软件手术的，就说你要提高接收率，呃，减少结石的负荷，可能还是。掏出来，在这个双管软件中作用很大。就说，我就说，有时候啊，你看，有有时候不同的结石、啊、大小不一样，有时候选择，呃，是三爪的、四爪的，还是往来状的。有时候你掏的多了，可能你这个结石到鱼管交界处，你狭窄或者到这个鞘这个口的时候，你拉不出来。还有一些，你有时候太小的结石，你用三爪、四爪的，有时候有时候可能掏不住它，不好掏。就像我经常问陈教授一个问题啊，就说你。再根据你手术的情况和结石的情况，你怎么选择不同的套齿栏？是三爪四爪还是往栏状的？想请教陈教授这个问题。啊，其实我们最常用的还是三四的往栏，因为刚才我也介绍了，可能我刚才有一段是呃，可能这个网络断了，我没讲清楚。呃，就是一般三四往栏呢，它我们取势比较方便，它是正对结石抓取的，所以呢操作的难度比较低。那么，但是呃，有的时候四四的话呢，可以呃抓比较大的结石，因为尤其在下展的结石，如果我们去直接在下展击打，那么其实对内倾的消耗，包括以后这些结石碎片的排泄呢，都会有有些影响。所以一般在下展结石呢，我们呃尽可能把它移位到中上展击碎石。当然，有的时候结石比较大、嵌盾的话呢，我们又把它击碎之后再移位。所以四四的话呢，移位结石会比较好一点。那么当当然，因为我们。作为医生来讲，不可能同同一台手术用多个网栏，所以我们会观察好这个结石情况之后，决定哪个网栏是多多功能性最好的。那么刚才我介绍那个我们播客的这个最新的那个四四的网栏，它有个什么好处呢？它可大可小，它可以抓取大的结石，但是对一毫米的结石呢，它也可以抓取。呃，所以呃呃，因为我是看了它那个视频，我觉得是非常好的器械。当然，因为在我们上海现在还还没进来，呃，我们还没试用过。那么我我期待呢。有这个新的产品呢，能够呃进到我们临床，那么单个网栏就可以解决我们大部分问题，那是最好的啊、呃！谢谢。哎，王教授，你还有问题吗？哦、谢谢王教授，谢谢谢谢。哎，好，感谢陈奇教授的精彩分享啊！呃，这个环节呢，我们呃很荣幸邀请到了这个台湾林口长庚纪念医院的崔克红教授，呃，作为我们的点评专家。有请崔克红教授。崔教授在吗？呃，有，听得到吗？哎，听得到。是，呃，感，是感谢呃 C U A 邀请我做点评。我是林口长庚泌尿科崔克红教授。那个人非常有机会，呃，有幸参加这个聚会。那我从你们的演讲者发现几个问题可以请教吗？第一个是有关病患安全的问题哈，第一个讲者有关病患安全。那我个人在林口长庚从事主管很多年，那发现，呃，专业人员的安全也是很重要。请问你们，呃，你们做这个手术做久了之后，超过几岁之后就没办法再继续做了。所以我们现在正在开发用机器人辅助来做软式输尿管镜，减少我们的我们的人员的伤害。第二个就有关我们的腹膜的支架，请问在不晓得在腹膜支架在使用当中，如果有发现，呃，发现如果后腹腔被纤维化的病人，请问成功率有多少呢？谢谢。好，谢谢崔教授。那个第一个问题是费翔教授，费翔教授在吗？费教授，是。因为我们在手术当中会常常会造成专业人员的人力或是，不管是颈椎或是手臂、肩椎的受伤，呃，请问呃，这个专业人员的保护也是我们很重要的。不晓得在您的经验是怎么样？呃，好，谢谢崔教授。不好意思啊，我个人说的话就是说，如果石头特别大的话呢，就要分期了。就是你假如说一个石头，你要事前跟他讲好，你判断一下你大概需要做的多长时间。当然跟你设备啦，跟你这个就是也都有关系。你假如激光很好，然后你的鞘可以放更粗一点的，那相对来说呢，可能就会好得多。但如果你设备不行的话，你一算这个一个一般来说，我个人意见的话，你一个手的同一个位置，你超过一个小时，那这手肯定就不行了。你时间长的话，腱鞘炎肯定会有的，对吧？所以说。
不是说必须非要去牺牲自己去。去去来成就患者，为什么？就是说我后来我说，就是这个机器人啊，做这个解释将来是必然的一个趋势，尤其机器人做软件，这是个必然的趋势。呃，所以说我不知道这么说您是不是会满意啊？就是不行的话就分期吧。谢谢。崔主任，嗯、呃，您好，崔教授。呃，我是胡大夫。呃，刚才您第二个问题是关于这个覆膜支架、覆膜和纤维化的，呃，是这样，简单的说啊，呃，覆膜和纤维化的病人我们做过一些了啊、呃。我想第一个要考虑的问题呢，就是我们以什么样为治疗目标？还是我刚才提到的，我们是以治愈治疗还是维持性治疗？目前来讲，我们没有治愈性治疗的这种病人的结果啊，就是我们比如放了半年、一年以后给他拔出来会是什么样？啊，这个我们没有结果，但是我们有维持性治疗的这个病人的结果。我们有病人一发一年多的话，目前通畅性是好的。需要注意的问题就是，腹膜和纤维化的病人很多都是长段狭窄的病人，多段狭多处狭窄的病人。那么腹膜支架是一个局段的支撑啊，局段的支撑的结果就是有可能病人在一根支架不够，可能会需要两根啊，甚至有病人三根啊。呃，所以说呢，在术中的时候，我们要做全程的输尿管造影啊，让他的这个狭窄的部位。长度啊、呃，个数我们都要清晰的一个掌握。我我不知道我的问呃回答您您，嗯，谢谢。那不晓得问题，不晓得崔教授，你的经验是父母支架的，他成功率大部分都是放一次就成功呢，还是多久可以拿一次？啊、哦，呃，是这样，呃，所以说问题就是我们什么时候把它拔出来的问题啊，呃，国内特殊的原因就是我们现在，呃。我这其实这个问题我跟国外也沟通过很多次啊，就是跟因为他们做的确实比我们时间长，呃，以前欧洲呢是他们因为他们的注册证是一年啊、呃，最早是半年，他们到时间都拔，那么但是拔完以后发现很多病人就是支架挺好的啊、呃，所以他没有他觉得没有必要再放一个新的支架过去，后来他们就把这个注册证延长到三年了，所以在欧洲呢这个注册证是三年，就跟在体内留置时间是三年，那么在国内的就。问题呢，就是我们现在注册证还没有到三年，所以按照如果按照合法的角度讲，我们应该在一年的时候给它拔掉。但是问题在于很多病人，呃，也是他觉得这个费用比较高，还有多受一次罪，所以我们现在是严密的随访啊、呃。如果病人支架是通畅的，没有出现相关的并发症，我们就暂时不给他先拔啊、呃。如果有问题了再拔啊、呃。谢谢，谢谢，好、哦，谢谢主任。好的，感谢崔教授啊，感谢崔教授的这个点评，也感谢呃其他几位专家的这个精彩分享。由于时间关系啊，我们进入这个下一个板块，下边有请啊下一个板块的主持主持人啊李军教授，有请李教授。嗯，再次感谢崔教授，这个今天是临时把崔教授请上来为我们的大会做一个点评。那么呃现在呢我们。呃，将进入今呃今天的这个呃 Master Forum 这个这个环节。这个环节呢，我们请到了两位这个来自于国外的这个专家。一位呢是我们的老朋友了，这个 Professor Yasser， 他是 AAU， 就是阿拉伯语泌尿外科协会的 Secretary。嗯、呃，另外一个呢是 Professor Zam。他们两个人呢，实际上是一前一后。呃 ，Yasser 呢是这个。WCE 的二零一九的 Co-President， 咱们是二零二零的 Co-President， 但是很不幸，因为今年呢这个肺炎闹得乱七八糟，所以呢这个咱们呢他就是顺延到了二零二一或者二零二二，但是无论如何呢，下一届的这个 WCE 呢肯定是要在俄罗斯举办的，所以呢也希望呢，将来我们大家能够在俄罗斯呢再再一次这个展示我们中国的这个工作。那么，呃，我现在叫一下啊，呃，张 ，OK，Yes，Yes，Hi，Can、yes, yes, you hear me？ 啊、uh, ，Yeah，Very clear。And also,、uh, yeah, hello, yes,、yeah, yes, sir. So it, it's time、Hello. for you, your turn. And、uh, now I think it's the、uh, first session will be, uh, Professor Sam, and his topic is the、uh, polyp fiber technique. Yeah, we. Okay.、Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, I will. I, I, I wish, I wish, uh, we can learn something from from you and from uh your hospital about the okay,、well, new technique. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, thank you for the invitation. I want to uh um 
uh, thank the uh, organizers of the meeting as well as the uh, Pusin Medical for the invitation. And uh, it's my honor to, pre to be presenting today um, alongside Dr. Yasser Farahat, who is uh, one of the most established academicians that I know. And um, by that, I, will I would like to present on the tholium fiber laser. Can you see my screen? I can see, clear. Okay, great. Um, so <clears throat> this is a uh, new technology that has done a lot of noise in the current uh, field of urology, especially in endourology. And I just wanted to talk about the fundamentals of the laser. What, what's the difference between the currently existing technology? Where do we stand with the laser, laser with, in terms of the testing of the laser in the lab, and I'll, I'll cover a little bit of the um, uh, clinical uh, experience that we have, we published recently, and um, and I'll be happy to take any pictures, uh, any any questions today. So the outline of the today's um, lecture is I want to talk a little bit about the history and who developed and who made it um, prominent and made it, um, you know, to the current state of the. Uh, the market, which is, uh, you know, just, just got approved in the, uh, by the FDA in the United States. And the same uh, way, it's, the laser has been approved in, in Europe. So it's, it's getting widely adopted into the field. And as we move forward, I think in the next six months or one year, we're going to be seeing more and more uh, clinical publications and testing and feedback. And additionally, I would like to speak about the fiber laser platform principles of the operation, as I said, you know, compared to solid state lasers. I want to talk about what kind of parameters we can use for urological applications. And um, I want to talk, cover the fundamentals for lithotripsy and a little bit about soft tissue applications. Um, and history is, as you can see on my, uh, can you see my mouse moving? Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. so. The thulium fiber laser, the concept was invented by uh, Professor Gaponsep. You can see him on the first picture. And he actually, um, he's a professor of, he used to be the professor of Moscow State University from Russia. And later on in the 90s, um, he immigrated to the United States. And he created this uh, company, which is called IPG Photonics. And Everything is based on this new type of thulium fiber laser technology. And it's widely used in dermatology. It's used in um, ophthalmology. And now this new wave of technology is being applied in urology. And the next person who is um, uh, Nathaniel uh, Fried, he is in, he's, uh, located in uh, University of North Carolina. And he was the uh, one of the pioneers in the field who actually started applying this technology in stone disease. So basically he, he is a bioengineering a PhD. He's not a clinician, but he performed the fundamental studies applying this laser in stones in, in an in vitro in lab, uh, lab settings and kind of opened a new revenue, new platform, new application for this amazing laser. And another person who actually was very important is Dr. Frankenstein. He was, um, he was one of the uh, pioneers also uh, based in Germany, I believe, who uh, invented the first machine, which was based on 120 watts. Um, and um, subsequently, these machines were tested in Russia in limited capacity until, as you know, all this, you know, Professor Olivier Traxer, he's you know, very well known in Europe and worldwide and especially in China too. He was the per first person who started um, using this clinically. He, you know, started traveling to Russia, co you know, collaborating with the Russian colleagues. And this probably in 2008 was what, which, you know, where, where he hosted the World Congress of Endourology. This, this technology had his peak uh, of uh, presentation. So, um, and Dr. Martov, he's also a very prominent endourologist in Russia. He's a president of the Endourologist Society of Russian Endourology. So he kind of used the clinically, these guys made 
so these four people basically made this technology a new uh, platform, new opportunity for uh, you know exploration in in our field. So, um, and I just want to, and then the next slide. Uh, this is a very simplified, and I hope that this is not too complicated for urologists. So I'll try to explain. This is the main, you know, main core of what is thulium fiber laser. So the main difference is this is a diode laser. It has two highly refracting mirror on the both sides, which kind of generates and reflects the uh, laser energy. And if you look in the uh, bigger picture, like what the the main difference is that this laser can be very long. It can it can range from anywhere from 30 to uh, anywhere 10 to 30 meters, um, which is very rare to the thulium. Uh, I mean, the Holman laser technology, they can't make these kind of long uh, fiber lasers. Um, and but thulium is a different technology. And if you look at the um, the core, you know, the kind of micro uh, picture of the laser, you, what you will see is it has a very tiny, very thin 10 micron core doped. Doped means it's covered by thulium ions. That's what it makes it very special. And then and, and it's covered by silica cladding, which can, you can see it in clinical with uh, naked eye. And instead of using uh, <clears throat> uh, flesh lump, it's called, so I'll, in the next slide, you will see um, uh, the way the holomium laser kind of generates the uh, beam and it's called flash pumping. But instead of that, this uses diode laser pumping beam, which is um, kind of new technology that doesn't generate a lot of heat and a lot of energy. And that 10 millimicron tiny doped uh, core allows to create a very small, very, very um, good quality a laser beam that you can see when you activate the laser laser beam, uh, the green dot, you can see that even in a tiny 70 micron or 50 micron laser fibers, you can see a very um, distinctive uh, laser beam. And I've seen it in the laboratory. We haven't used the 50 micron laser fiber in clinically because it's like almost invisible uh, and with the naked eye. But when you activate the laser beam, you can see the laser beam on a stone or any surface very clearly. So potentially if you want to use a 50 micron laser fiber, you can use it, but um, basically you can see it, but you can see the laser uh, beam. This is the fundamental. So if you, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask me and on, at the end of the talk or in between, if you don't understand anything about the fundamentals, this is the main difference. And I'll talk a little bit about the, um, what's the difference of the holmium laser technology. As I said, these holmium laser, holmium YAG technology uses a flash lamp kind of to pump the energy and it has a water cooling device because flash lamps use so much energy and that's why it's so noisy and generates so much energy that it can it can heat your operating room. It can make it's so powerful. It uses so much energy that they need to use a water cooling, which generates a lot of noise. When you activate the whole new YAC laser, that's why you hear like this very you know noisy um, env environment. And because of that cooling system, water cooling system in, within the laser device. The holmium lasers, if you see the luminous or other uh, laser devices, it's, it's very big, it's huge. Um, that's why, it, you know, that's the main difference. And as we discussed in the previous, um, this, uh, you know, tholium fiber doesn't use that flash pump, so the flash lamp, so there's no need for water cooling. And if you look at the, um, picture of the tholium fiber device itself, it's very small and it can use your wall power, just any, you know, 120 wall power or 220 in, in, in Europe. And you can plug it in the, in the wall and then it works, it works like a magic. And you can just carry it anywhere internationally and, you know, it's easy to transport compared to um, holomium laser. Um, 
And then another limitations of the Holmium laser, it's uh, because it's fixed 2.1, uh, was we call it to you know 210 um, uh, it's a wavelength, which is fixed wavelength. You can change that. It's uh, uh, you know it has very low electrical optical efficiency, despite it's a hundred uh, 120 watt laser. Um, it has pulsed mode operation it has two high peak power. So basically it creates two pulse, which is the main reason why you have a retropulsion. So that's not optimal thing, right? We don't want to have that kind of retropulsion, but because, and the same with the red, you know, MOSIS technology, it creates two pulses coming, you know, hitting one first, first mode is uh, first, wave is hitting the water, creating that Moses effect. And the second one is actually hitting the, uh, the stone. But at the same time, you are creating that retropulsion which makes, it, which makes the uh, lithotripsy extremely complex. Um, as I said, and then, you know, um, and similarly, which is also, um, you know, it's a YAG technology, but thulium YAG technology, it doesn't use that, um, previously mentioned flash lamp technology, but it uses diode laser bars, uh, which is a uh, pumped kind of, you know, pulse technology as well. It also uses water cooling because in similar to Holmium lag technology, it creates a lot of heat. That's why it's still big and it, it has, has a lot of uh, noise and it's still, you know, fake, fake, fixed wavelength. So if you pay attention to wavelength, I, you know, I'll speak about the wavelength, why it's applicable clinically in, in, in the next few slides. So having a fixed wavelength at 2.1 or 2.05, that's not a good thing because um, you know, you'll, you'll see in the later slides, the absorption of the water and the, the human tissue wavelength is lower than 2.010 or 2.5. And when you create that wavelength, which is not aligned with the human, you know, water and human tissue, you're creating more resistance, you're creating more uh, energy, you're creating more damage. That's why the beauty of the um, uh, thulium fiber technology, because its wavelengths is selectable. You can select anywhere between 1.85 to 2.15 and optimal setting is 1940. This is the optimal uh, wavelength for human water, human tissue. And when you, when you select that uh, wavelength, it kind of works with water. So, you know, there's no resistance. So there's no, uh, that extra energy that's being created. So there's no retropulsion, there's no extra energy and, and lithotripsy is more efficient. And you will see it in the next slides and I'll explain it even bit better. So average power is up to 200 watts, which, which is huge. I believe Luminous is, Dr. Farhad, correct me but, uh, if I'm wrong, but I think Luminous is up to 120 watt, 20 watts. Um, and current technology of the thulium fiber, you can go up to um, 500 watts with the machine we have in the uh, and the peak power is up to one kilowatt, which is huge. And pulse width is extremely uh, uh, wide. You can pick any pulse width between 0 0.1 to 30 milliseconds, which is amazing. You can do dusting, fragmentation. You can pick your uh, pulse width anywhere you want. And energy per pulse is uh, extremely efficient. Pulse rate is extremely low and you can go up to 3,000 uh, gigahertz. Uh, and, um, and it, you know, it uses air cooling. So there is no water cooling in the machine, which makes the machine very small and you can transport it from the operating room to, to another operating room. Or if you're going to another hospital, you can carry it. So it's very um, lightweight because that, that doesn't have that water cooling mechanism within the device. Um, so this is the, um, the wavelength that I'm talking about. So if you look at the bottom, uh, bottom numbers, 2000, this is 1940 is where the optimal wavelength of water. So if you look at, the, at this line water, it peaks, that wavelength peaks at 1940. So the same thing with thulium fiber wavelength, when you select that energy 
uh, wavelength, it matches with water wavelength in the human tissue wavelength. So they're very aligned. And then efficiency of the laser of that energy transmission to the tissue, to your, um, to your stone, it's very efficient. And if you compare it to thulium YAG or holmium YAG, their wavelengths are completely off. They don't match with the human body tissue or water, but that's why it creates a lot of um, retropulsion. That, that's why it's not as efficient as thulium fiber. And you will, uh, I have more slides to make it even more clear. So here we go. So these are the KTP is another type of laser, which is, it's not very commonly used, but you know, thulium fiber, fiber is becoming more popular now. Thulium YAG is also less commonly used, but homium, homium YAG, they have completely different uh, wavelengths. That's why it's not as efficient as um, thulium fiber. If you look at it, thulium fiber is aligned with the, uh, the surrounding tissue wavelength, which makes it absorption, absorption coefficient is very high, twice, twice as high as thulium YAG and five times higher than holmium YAG. And the same, because it's so efficient and you can control the uh, laser wavelength, penetration in the tissue is, 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 it's minimal. You can see that how it's, it's like your hair, like the, you know, the penetration tissue. And if you look at it, at holmium yak, for example, if you're doing a, you know, hole up, you know, removal, you're removing the prostate tissue, you're potentially damaging the tissue much deeper with holmium laser compared to thulium fiber. So if you have a nervous tissue around the prostate or some, you know, you're doing a hole up, you're potentially damaging deeper, deeper tissue with holmium YAG. But with thulium technology, you have very minimal penetration in tissue and very minimal penetration in water. And, um, you know, ablation threshold is much more efficient than the uh, other laser technologies. And it's not like that's something that, you know, we didn't make this data. This is something that we, tested in the laboratory, something that we have very meticulously, you know, measured in our, you know, laboratory that we have uh, UCI. And, you know, the Russian colleagues, you know, uh, from Sechenov University and Dr. Traxer, they, they have done a tremendous of work showing, uh, you know, exactly these kind of results. So these are the main different, you know, differences in uh, all these fiber technologies. And this is another demonstration of, you know, um, so KTP laser, it's, it's horrible. You have no control over penetration. So if you want to use this laser and you're ablating the prostate or something within the kidney, it's going to just burn the whole, you know, multiple layers of the tissue. And, and then you're causing coagulation necrosis. You have no control of the penetration. Whereas whole laser is a little bit less but at the same time, as not, it's not as controllable as thulium fiber, which gives you the minimal penetration to the uh, soft tissue and you know, much more control of your tissue and ablation within the, uh, within the tissue that you are abl ablating. Um, so there are two types of the you know, continuous, uh, uh, pulse, uh, continuous mode and you have obviously pulse mode. We have, you know, uh, we just basically breaking down the, um, that continuous pool pulse, but at the same time, you're generating 120 watts as efficient as, you know, as a continuous, but for um, a fragmentation, it's, uh, it's much more efficient. And, you know, this is the new, you know, super pulse, which is, you know, becoming very popular. You use uh, pulse mode, but at the same time, because it's called super pulse, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, sacrifice your power, peak power. It gives you a pulse mode, just like in the previous slide, but at the same time, you're getting this 500 um, watt peak power, which is, I mean, can you even imagine that? That's like, a, I mean, so much power. And um, it's, it's, it's much more efficient than other technology. So, so, I just want to talk now about the what you know stone studies we have done. I think this these you know we cover the fundamentals of the um, the laser. Now, if we talk about a little bit more about clinical stuff and the laboratory stuff, those concepts will kind of hopefully will make sense to you. 
And again, if you don't understand something at the end of the, uh, the lecture, feel free to ask me questions and I'll be happy to answer. And this is the fundamentals of how you break down stones. And I'm sure like a lot of people know about this stuff, but I'm gonna talk about it anyways. How, when you apply laser, how do you break down the stone? And this laser, uh, this slide kind of shows that um, 20, about 20% 20 of your stone, because it's in the kidney, it's a, you know, highly, um, you, you know, it's a wet environment. So you have about 20% of water. So when you apply the laser energy to the stone and it has water inside, the way the lithotripsy works is that you know, the, that wavelength that's going into the stone kind of prov provide, you know, creates vaporization of the water. And by that, it creates that energy that's kind of breaking down your stone. And that's why you have fragmentation and dusting. And why thulium fiber laser is efficient because it's aligned, the wavelength of the fiber laser is aligned with the fiber, uh, the wavelength of the water within the stone. Uh, I hope that makes sense. This is something that I covered extensively in the previous slides. So since you have that kind of the water and the, the laser energy aligned on the same wavelength, so energy is being delivered more efficiently and you potentially creating more vaporization and you're making more efficient uh, lithotripsy. I hope that makes sense. And that's why uh, again, this slide shows that thulium fiber is perfectly aligned with the wavelength of the water. By that, it creates very efficient lithotripsy. That's why you have very small dusts um, if you're doing the dusting. And the whole after application of this technology, the traditional dusting was not a dusting anymore. That's why these guys, they invented a new terminology, which is called fine dusting. It makes the dust even dustier, I guess, you know. So it's, um, that's why it's called fine dusting. That, that all these technology, I think it's important to understand the fundamentals uh, in order to understand why this laser is such a hype, you know, hype and why this is so efficient. I think if you understood a few of the slides and concepts that I spoke about, I think this makes very scientifically clear uh, sense. And when you pay potentially evaporate, you know, applying that energy within the water of the, you know, the stone that you are uh, uh, lasering, you're creating very efficient vaporization and you're creating fine dusting. And, um, you know, the, the fragmentation of the, 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 um, the size of these dusts are less than 100 millimicron, which is unbelievable. I have a video of an edited video. This is like from beginning to end of, you know, 12, one, a little bit about, you know, 12 millimeter stone, 1.2 centimeter stone, and I have not edited it. You see like how this creates a dust. Um, so this, uh, this is a bigger slide and, and I'll let you guys watch it. It's a, you know, it's, it's a minute video and this is a complete untouched stone and you will see how this kind of completely creates a fine dust. You can basically just wash it away through your uh, scope. You, you do you see the dust it's creating? I hope this is uh, this is visible to any, uh, to everybody. No, not yeah. Yes. So this is that. This is yes. This is unedited video. You basically, uh -huh. you know, and density of this stone is uh, thirteen hundred, which is pretty hard stone, and uh, you know you 1300. can thirteen hundred. Thirteen hundred. Yes. Yes. Very it's hard. a hard stone. Just just like melt. Exactly. Do you see what happened to the stone? disappear, but no dust. Exactly, so, and then all these particles, you see how small that is. You can yeah. basically, if you have an axis sheath in the, you know, you read, you know, in the ureter, you can basically wash it out and then nothing leaves in the kidney. So, 
And in terms of fragmentation, and then this is another summary video, a summary, and then I have all the citations and I'm not making up these uh, data. This is, you know, evidence-based. So if you, anybody who's interested, you know, reach out to me via email or on my Twitter, which I will give it to you after, after at the end of the lecture, feel free to reach out to me and I'll get, I'm happy to give you all these references and papers to you. So basically, if you look at the fragmentation, thulium fiber laser is much more efficient. Dusting, fine dusting is three times more efficient than holmium laser. Popcorning time is much less than um, holmium laser. Retropulsion is significantly less. And I've used this laser in the laboratory and clinically, and I can say, and I, I don't get paid by, you know, thulium company because I've, I've just used it clinically. There's retropulsion is significantly less. And temperature is the same as holmium laser. And we've done uh, some animal studies testing this um, temperature effect. And we're going to be publishing soon, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, that's the only thing that's comparable to holmium laser uh, technology. And this is the first clinical experience that we published with Dr. Traxer and the Russian team from Moscow. Uh, we looked at the 100, this is a prospective study, uh, prospectively done study, but we kind of wrote, analyzed it retrospectively. We looked at 120 patients with stones less than three centimeters and all of them underwent PCNO. This is a single center experience in Moscow and most um, because it's a PCNL, most mode, you know, was used fragmentation mode with these kind of characteristics with, you know, 30, 25 to 30 uh, watts and uh, with this range of um, settings and uh, less than one uh, joules of uh, energy. And this clinical experience basically showed that, you know, mean stone size was uh, 14 millimeters. You know, about 25, you know, largest stones were about 2.5 centimeters. Mean density, as you can see, is pretty hard. You know, it's, um, it's not like, you know, kind of soft stones. And stone free rate is actually comparable to other PCNLs, probably a little higher. I think on average, if you deliberately do, you know, stone follow up with CT and like, you know, all those stuff, I think it's about 75, 80%. And this, this, you know, this is comparable and complication rate. Uh, this is 17% is a little higher than the literature, but this is compared with, you know, combined with minor and major complications all together is 17%. Retropulsion was, was, so we gave a questionnaire to all the surgeons kind of ranking uh, the retropulsion. And we asked if, you know, yes and no question saying like, did you feel like a retropulsion interfered with your surgery? And, and less than 2% of the uh, occasions surgeons who operated, they said there was no like significant amount of retropulsion. And uh, t in 10% of the cases, surgeons said there was some retropulsion, which was not significant, but there was some. So. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, in you know, this is the first clinical experience. I think now Olympus is performing much more um, uh, clinical studies, and Europe now has the device. I think all over the, all over Europe. I think we're wow. going to see more and more clinical um, studies be being published, and hopefully, um, you know, this will be. Um, as if, you know, this will be the compared to comparable studies. So in summary, um, highest absorption by water ensures high efficiency of stone tissue ablation and provides improved safety margin of surrounding soft tissues. And as I said, that kind of wavelength comparison is something that you should always keep in mind when you talk about thulium fiber technology, because that's the key why this is so efficient. Uh, this has much more uh, optimal peak power, long pulls with uh, pull shaping, minimizing stone red repulsion. As you know, as I showed, you can kind of break down the uh, pulse effects and that kind of minimizes your red repulsion. Uh, it has extremely limited penetration into soft tissue, which allows you to be so precise when you, when you uh, work with the soft tissue. And very good beam quality, that kind of 10 micron small beam enables to use 
tip to tip to micron fibers, which is unimaginable. Like smallest fiber on in homing laser is 200 micron, which is, you know, when you do flexible ureteroscopy, kind of you know can limit your ability to do certain things in the lower pole, right, or in the certain calluses. But if you have 100 micron or 150 micron laser, and you can see the tip when the, with the laser beam, you know, you're not, you know, sacrificing any flexibility of the scope. Uh, so that makes it very efficient. And, you know, the future, I think, as I said, is very bright for this technology. And I think hopefully in, you know, current data shows that uh, it's, and again, I may be biased, but you know, you you have to make your own uh, observation and read the literature, and hopefully you can be able to use it in the near future. But I think thulium is here to potentially replace holmium laser, and I think um, uh, it has all the potential and all the uh, characteristics and abilities uh, to do that with the with the data that we have seen so far. And obviously we have to see more and more clinical data, but bench studies are very promising. And I think, um, you know, we have to be excited and look for more upcoming clinical data. Um, so these kind of studies we need, we have to uh, assess, uh, you know, what kind of injuries that we're doing. We have to see if any damages to the uh, channels of the, you know, instruments. We have to see assessment of the bleeding, uh, potential uh, strictures after laser uh, and you know any complications looking at the uh, you know more kind of objective ways and i want to thank uh pusen for inviting me an opportunity we've been you know collaborating with pusen uh, uh, technology uh for a long time and uh, they've been an excellent uh, uh you know uh partners and uh we have exciting some uh, works coming up in the near future um, and by that, I would like to conclude my lecture. And I'm sorry it took a little longer than you allowed me, but um, yeah. I hope that you learned something. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me now or reach out to me on uh, Twitter or via email, and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ram. Uh, so, uh, very interesting, fantastic. Uh, finally, I know the Tulum laser tulum fiber technique, finally, I, I know it. I, I know the mechanism and I know what the tulum fiber technique can do for us. So uh, very interesting, uh, you said uh, the efficiency is very high and uh, it, it can reach hundreds of volts, even thousand volts. Five. Yeah. Yeah. 500 so, watts, yeah. yes. Compare, yeah, compare with the uh, tulum, no, 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 compare with the uh, Holium. Uh, because now we can only reach maybe 20, 40 volt for the um, maybe luminance or other brand of the Holium laser. But hundreds of volt, it means nuclear bomb inside the body. <laughs> compare. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. It, will, it will damage the kidney, seriously injure the kidney as well. This is one question. And the other, so you mean no heat product by the tulum technique. So maybe uh, it can become a portable device for us. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we, 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 can, yeah, we can bring it. I think I out. agree. Like, I think, you know, I'm obviously I don't, you know, I think it's, you know, when I, when you use the machine and you try to, you know, in the, in the laboratory, we try to use the 500, my 500 watt machine, put mm -hmm. it on the like top and the machine said, no, you can't use that. It's not optimal. And I think, you know, just, this is, you know, we have to make the, obviously we're not going to use it that kind of high power in the clinical scenario in a patient, but I think this is a one, this, this technology kind of breakthrough shows you that this is feasible, right? And we may need to do other modifications to, to be able in the future, in foreseeable future, hopefully, to use this kind of energy to be more efficient. But in the current state, we can't use it. But again, the fact that they discovered this kind of power and put it in, they are able to put it in a small machine and allow us to use it, it takes us to the next step of developing new technology. And I think 
that's all about innovation, right? So currently that, that power is not usable. Maybe they will come up with modifications of other parameters and we can kind of balance that and use it in a more efficient way. So, but I agree that in a 500 watt will blow up the patient probably. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, Professor Song and uh, two Professor Wang will uh, command you topic. Maybe they will maybe they have some questions okay thank you thank you for your, your lecture for us and this is a very interesting uh, lecture uh, in china the hormone uh, laser is uh, used uh, very popular but the one we uh, elevate the power of the hormone uh, laser the heat injury to the uh, uterine wall uh, is also uh, come uh, very popular uh, and a lot of uh, structure of the ureter wall uh, occurred. Uh, but in uh, but the uh, sodium uh, fiber uh, fiber laser has no penetration in the tissue uh, in the uh, uh, ureter tract wall, and the uh, maximum tissue absorption of the water. I think maybe the it it, it will. Uh, increase the injury of the uterine tract wall. Uh, we very expect uh, the uh, sodium laser machine come to our clinical work. Thank you again for your lecture. Thank you. So, so thank you very much for the comment. I appreciate it. So finally, before, you know, I don't want to hold up Dr. Uh, Dr. Farhad. I, 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 I totally like I'm over my time. Uh, but the final comment is that we have some data coming up I, and I didn't want to put it on slides because it's a uh, it's confidential data. We want to publish it first before I share it on uh, public platforms. We actually compared the temperature, both uh, holmium laser and MOSES and thulium fiber. And as I showed you in one of the uh, slides, temperature changes are same as between all the lasers. Uh, penetration is a different topic, but if you if you're working in the you know collecting system, what we showed in this data is you have to use in a pulse mode. When you use in a pulse mode, your temperature is dropping and doesn't increase. But if you're continuously activating laser in a fragmentation mode, you are reaching your peak power, which is if you reach 44 degrees, that's where you make significant damage to the collecting system and cause coagulation uh, necrosis, 44 degrees. And, but if you use a access sheet, which improves your um, irrigation in the collecting system, and if you put not heated, but cold irrigation water, and you use it with the access sheet, temperature significantly drops. And you, you have like up to five minutes of time continuous ablation until you reach that 45, 45 degrees. So key is use access sheet when you laser and use cold water. If you use some people, we in the clinic, before we got this data, we used to heat water until 37 degrees for a patient's body temperature, but that kind of contributes and increases your uh, temperature very um, rapidly. So, if you use access sheet and cold water irrigation, like room temperature, which is 25, 27, you have up to five minutes of continuous laser activation and safely not, not damaging your collecting system. So that's a, that's a data that's being published, uh, but you know, I didn't want to put on the slides, but that's something to keep in mind if you're already using uh, the, uh, the thulium fiber. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, questions from both Professor Wang. Thank you very oh, okay. much, Dr. Zhang, for your great talk. I've learned a lot. Uh, so from your presentation, we know tumor laser now can widely use the technology, including the treat the stones and the prostate. And you also right. explained a lot, the details about the tumor laser fiber. Uh, sometimes uh, it's hard for me to understand the mechanical things about the laser. In China, uh, most hospitals 
use the human laser. It's more popular in China right now. So can you compare the advantages and the disadvantages uh, for the tumor lasers and the human lasers in clinical ways? Uh, as we know, you, has, uh, you have explained a lot about the advantages of the, about the tumor laser. So the main advantage, two main advantages, mm -hmm. as a physician you would appreciate is retropulsion. You probably like, when you go into the kidney, you probably chase around a stone, right? And you do yeah. all this like, you know, stone basketing and you, you put the stone in the basket and you try to hold it in one place. That's a significant difference. Like you see thulium fiber, um, you get probably 50% about or 40, 50% less retropulsion and we compared in the same similar scenario. So you don't have that stones like flying. You know, you saw the, you saw the video I showed you and yes. that's the huge advantage. And another advantage is it creates a dust. You use dusting and it creates, it's a, uh, you know, dust a bit. So if you use the fine dusting, you can see this, you can see it. It's like, it's, it just flashes out. And if you use a fragmentation mode, it looks like uh, the dusting mode of the holmium in mm -hmm. a fragmentation of the thulium. I actually was showing in, during the, we had a course in February. So I was showing the thulium fiber laser to the attendees. And I had the fragmentation mode uh, activated and it was creating like little particles you can see visually. And they were like, oh, that's the fragmentation mode. So can you put the dusting mode? I was like, mm -hmm. no. This is a this is like a fragmentation mode. It's cre it creates the size of the particles that's equivalent to the um, dusting of the holmium. Does that make sense, or is it confusing? Yeah, it's okay. So it creates very small particles that you can wash it out mm -hmm. without, yeah. you know. So those are two advantages, I would say. Mm -hmm. So how about I hope disadvantages? Disadvantages. Uh, disadvantages, it's not available. It's not, it's not easily available. It's expensive. Yeah, expensive. Um, it's very expensive. Uh, disadvantages, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't have this. I, I, I have no comment for disadvantages. It's just like, it's going to be a price, I think. In Russia, mm -hmm. it's very, it's cheap. It's three times cheaper than Holmium. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the wow. pri price in Russia is 40000 but obviously Western market, it, it's much more expensive. And yeah. in the U.S. currently, it's a little more expensive than the Holmium. So that's one of the limitations, I think. Mm -hmm. But, you know, before this, like when I saw the first, like, characteristics of the Tholium fiber, it, like, it, it sounded to me before I used it myself, it's like this is like, this is a fair tale. Like you're telling me you're, this is like a, this is like the, this, there's no perfect thing in, in the world. Like, you know, before you use holmium laser, you say, I wish holmium laser had this, less retropulsion. I wish like smaller fibers. I wish it was like fine dusting, less temperature, blah, blah, blah. And then you look at the thulium fiber and you, they have all these things. And then you say like, no, this is unbelievable. But you know, you have to use it until you believe yourself. You know, seeing is believing. So. You, you, you have to use yourself until you believe, yeah. Otherwise, it's, it sounds like unbelievable, but. Yeah, so I think Thank till you. now, no disadvantage. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Professor Wang? Okay, <laughs> I think we have be finished. Okay, yeah. uh, dear professor, and then uh, first, uh, it's my pleasure to join your presentation and learn about the application of thulium fiber laser for lithotripsy, especially in the application of stone fine dusting. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the development of long plus thulium fiber laser or temple beam shaping will be necessary and the promising stone ablation results of the preminimal lithotripsy study should provide the motivation uh, for such laser development. Uh, you know, uh, in uh, most clinical center uh, in China, the humor laser is a main tool for uh, lethal trips surgery. So my question is about, uh, do you think what type of the stone is suitable for the uh, thulium fiber laser uh, for the lethal Thank you. 
Um, so I, I've heard, um, so we use a standard um, human tissues, uh, human stones and some um, uh, stones from um, dogs in, the, in our experiments. And clinically, it's most of them are calcium oxalate stones, and it's it's efficient. I've heard there is no data yet published, but some of the people clinically using, they say that thulium fiber is not as efficient in certain type of stones. I don't know what type yet because there's been nobody shares that data because it's uh, you know scientific confident confidential data until it's published, but. Um, I've heard that there are limitations in certain types of stones, but I can't comment on that because I don't have that kind of experience. But I think that data is emerging and in the next year, we'll have plenty of data that's gonna um, you know, show you know, as a previous question, like limitations of this laser fiber. And I think your first comment is yes, this, when you have a lot of options that creates competition and this kind of drives the field forward, right? Innovation and, if thulin laser fiber has some limitations, there will be another company who's going to address that limitation and make the lasers even better. So, you know, in, in, the, in the time of three, five years, maybe we'll have completely different type of laser that's going to make it even better. So as a urologist, as a receiver of the technology, and, and it's even better for patients, right? It's more efficient. It's, you know, if they drive the cost down, that would be even better. So it's all for good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. You're muted. We can yeah, hear you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Dam, and thank you for your sharing. And, uh, but, um, time limit, so we have to shift to Professor Yasser. I think Yasser is waiting for a long time. Uh, so the next topic will be uh, limitation, complication, and the future. Uh, sorry, perspective. So uh, let's invite Professor Yasser for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm just uh, sharing my screen. One minute. Uh, I have uh, some issue with sharing the screen just uh, in one minute. I try to yeah. find the solution. Yeah, in the meantime, we can talk, we can maybe, uh, if you have any more questions until he comes back, if you wanna uh, ask any questions about with laser. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think in the bottom, bottom line is, I think um, uh, thulium will replace the holmium uh, in the near future. So you will see more and more centers using the, uh, I don't know if it's approved uh, to use in China, uh, but the, um, more and more and more companies, uh, hospitals are buying that thulium in the United States yeah. and Europe, so. Yeah, I, I have one question. Uh, yeah, 
Should it? Have you ever tried tooling fiber with sisting stone? No, no, sisting stone, it's not quite hard. Maybe the city density is around 700 around. But yeah. uh, when we treat with uh, two, with there we go. He's, oil, he's back. Very, he's very back. hard. Yeah, he's back. He's back. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yes, very clear. Okay, I'm sorry for this uh, delay. Uh, so good morning from uh, Dubai. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Lee and all other colleagues for inviting me. It's a great honor for me to be here today with you. And uh, actually my talk it's, will be, uh, I need your share to share with you the knowledge and your experience I do understand that you have a lot of work in China. So uh, our expectation for the future of flexible electroscopy, are we expecting uh, flexible electroscopy are growing up or going to decline? So we have a poll, if uh, the IT can help us to share even the audience, are we expecting that flexible electroscopy is growing up or declining in the future? or we don't have enough data to say if it's growing up or not. So, do we have the pool can be available? Uh, sorry, yes sir. Maybe no, 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 not, not working. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so actually for uh, to, uh, this very important to help us to expect the future of flexible is growing up or not. But to answer this question, we have to go through into two important aspects. Always we have to remind ourselves with complication and what's the limitation that it may help the flexible retroscopy to grow up or not. If we talk about the complication, all of us know that most of the complication are minor complications, which doesn't need any uh, additional intervention. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very low percent of complication. This is for the minor complication. Major complication usually is very, very rare, but if it will happen like a vulgin of the ureter, it's really like a nightmare that can any urologist face. Uh, we have to remind ourselves how this happens. Sometimes we are doing a vigorous manipulation of the ureter that we are pulling hardly when we feel that in this video, the mucosa is coming with the ureter. It means that the stone is larger than the lumen and this may lead to urethral avulsion. Also, we have to remind ourselves that we have to avoid the blind busking. We have to see the all wires of the dormia to avoid adherence to the mucosa or pulling the mucosa. On the other hand, during introduction of the scope, we have to remember that the ureter is not straight tube. It's, we have multiple direction, multiple kinks, and we have if we have any uh, 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 trauma or perforation, we have to, to manipulate carefully. We have to stop to find the, the proper lumen. Also, this during uh, uh, exit, we have to check the ureter carefully because some unnoticed perforation can happen sometimes and that can lead to a further complication. And here we can see the importance of the safety guide wire that can help to, uh, uh, to, to stand to the patient to avoid further intervention. So ureter is not a straight tube, is not running in one direction. It has two curves, uh, uh, anteroposterior and lateral to medial, and this should be kept in our mind when we are manipulating with the ureter. So uh, apart from these two major complications, which is perforation and avulsion, if you look to the data coming from the end urology society for more than 12 thousand patients from 114 centers, we can see that the focus here is the stone migration, which reached to up to 10%, almost 10% uh, 
they found the stone migration and the residual fragments, which significantly affect the stone free rate. If we look into the, the technology, what's the reason behind the stone migration? Usually it comes due to irrigation or uh, the lithotraptor itself. So if we have a, a, a stone with wide ureter, we have to hold it with a dormia basket because the importance of irrigation is to, to give a good clarity, good vision, as we see in the right side of the video, we have a good irrigation, but it will lead to the migration. So you have to hold it with antiretrobulgent device or the dormia basket, but on the left side, you can see with low irrigation, you have low visibility and the stone can migrate if you are using especially the old lithotraptor. So we have to, to understand also that the irrigation, if we are going to a higher irrigation, that can lead to a further increase in intrarenal pressure, and it can lead to further post-operative complication like sepsis, urine tract infection, and fever, and other problems. A lot of devices available for irrigation, there is no evidence which is better than the other, each one based on his experience to have a balance between uh, a good visibility and relatively uh, low intrarenal pressure. And the axis sheath and its importance to reduce and minimize the intrarenal pressure is, is very crucial. That can help you to, to have a good visibility, good irrigation, and, and low intrarenal pressure. Uh, the second reason of stone migration other than the irrigation is the type of the lithotrapsy. If we are uh, don't have the new technology of the laser, if we still have the electrohydraulic or pneumatic, as we can see here, we need to have so, uh, one of these devices to help the uh, retropulsion of the stone. So you can fragment with old technology of fragmentation and you can uh, 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 reduce the residual fragments and reduce the stone migration. But keep in mind, this is an added extra cost to the procedure if you are using one of these devices. On the other hand, what else, as uh, Zam described the, uh, the, the, the concept behind thulium laser to, to reduce the uh, antiretrovulsion, we uh, have an experience with the uh, Holmium, especially with the MOSES technology that create two bubbles and it can, uh, uh, the first one pass through the water, the second one will go to the stone and it's significantly in our clinical practice, uh, it reduce the, uh, uh, the retrovulsion. Another factor when we have a new laser machine with adding the pulse duration, it's very important that it can reduce the retrovulsion because with the new device, that if you combine the energy frequency and the pulse duration, so you have eight combinations that can help you to, to change the parameters of the laser so it can fit with multiple uh, 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 settings that can help you to manipulate the stone perfectly. This is better than the older one when you have only the two options, energy and the frequency. So uh, between two parameters, we have only three combination which can be limit the, the manipulation of, of the stone. So uh, after discuss discussion about the complication, which is not that significant and the limitation uh, uh, of the scope, the second aspect that we have to keep in mind before thinking about the flexible retroscopy is growing up or not. So limitation, it can be multiple factors, but it can be anatomical factors. If you have difficult access to the ureter, so you can dilate either active dilatation or negative dilatation by stenting the patient and coming back in 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 few days stone factors it can be a limiting factor to the retroscopy but if we are limited to the guidelines not going for a larger stone so we have a, 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 a good results and better stone free rate in instrumental factors if we are choosing the good instrument with the uh, the technology that we have nowadays and i will run quickly about the eurotroscopy i just remind you 20 years back once we have only the rigid one with a large uh, size but now recently in the last 10 years we have a significant refinement in the scope in different aspects from rigid to flexible one improvement and refinement in the size becomes too small size that we can use it even in pediatric cases. Uh, refinement in the working channel that allows us to utilize multiple or different options of accessories and even some scopes with dual channel that you can utilize 
uh, two accessories at the same time, refinement ir in irrigation, giving you a good visibility and uh, a faster uh, procedure. Also improvement and refinement in the deflection that allow everyone to can access all calices easily, either the posterior or anterior groups. And the breakthrough of the shift of the uh, flexible retroscopy, which is from fiber optic to digital, which gives us a, a better visibility with all the advantages of the capabilities of the digital imaging that gives us all more details uh, about the uh, caliceal system. So the refinement, not only in the scope itself, uh, uh, but also in the other uh, accessories like the laser, as Zam described, also we have a competition from different types of laser, refinement in the accessories from Dormia basket, from forceps, anti devices, and different types of access sheets. So after reviewing the complication with the low incidence and reviewing the limitation and reviewing the uh, improvement in the accessories and the scope itself, let to ask ourselves, are still any limitation for flexible retroscopy? I will go to the evidence base. I will look to the European guidelines and we can see here in cases of a uh, uh, larger stone, even more than two centimeters, there is a recommendation, there is a space for flexible retroscopy if PCNL is not an option. On the other hand, in centers, and I believe in China, Professor Li have a large series of cases, so we can find the results coming with even larger stone with a, a good uh, uh, success rate or stone free rate. So after all of that, are still we expect in the future that we will have a limitation to flexible retroscopy? I can say yes, we have some limitation which is related to the cost and the longevity of the scope and ergonomics abroad. And here, I will share with you our experience that for the robot uh, uh, assisted uh, uh, retrograde intrarenal surgery that can answer this question. It improves the efficacy and reduces the adverse events and even reduce the professional hazards. When we talk about robot, usually it comes to our mind, the, the room setup that happens with Da Vinci, how complicated, how it's difficult to prepare, but with a robot assisted flexible retroscopy, it's very simple uh, setup. So after inserting the urethral access sheath manually, just fix the scope to the arm of the robot and then connect the irrigation, connect the laser, and here you are, sit back and relax and you can work. So it's one, two, three, four steps and in five to 10 minutes, you can be ready to utilize the scope. And how can you do that? You are controlling everything from a screen far from the exposure to radiation and you can, uh, control all motions of the scope, uh, either in and out, the rotation, the deflection, the irrigation, the laser. So you can control uh, 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 all parameters in, in more precise and more effective way. And at the same time, to avoid the ergonomics problem and you can avoid also the, uh, uh, the exposure to, uh, to radiation. Uh, uh, I, I will share with you how the uh, screen, uh, this is the small screen that we have with the robot, who, which is controlling all, all parameters, either vertical, horizontal control, you can control the irrigation, even if you need to make like a manual bump to flush for clarity of the vision. Uh, laser control and safety, which is very important that there is a chip at the tip of the uh, robot that prevent the laser to be fired if you are close to the tip or inside the scope and this is adding a, a, a safety feature to the scope. If you look to the rotation capability, it gives you a, a, a more wider range of rotation that it's difficult to get it with manual rotation. Uh, uh, so you can uh, rotate up to 440 degree with the robot. If you look to the, uh, the accuracy or precision of deflection, when you move the thumb in manually at 10 degrees, it deflects the tip around 60 degrees, but in robot, it's more precise when you deflect 10 degrees, it will deflect the tip 13 degrees, which it means synchronized movement between your, th your thumb and the tip of the scope. At the same time, you are controlling with two pedals, one for fluoroscopy if needed, and one for the laser. So 
from one console, you are controlling everything. And this is our uh, uh, initial data in my hospital, which we have around 145 cases. Uh, stone size, we are limited not to go for a larger stone size, it's 1.6. The docking time or the room setup is 10 minutes and the average fragmentation time, it is 25 minutes. The average total time is 45 minutes and stone free rate uh, is uh, almost 93%. Uh, adding to the advantages that you can work faster, shorter operative time, getting better results, better stone free rate, the professional hazards, which is a very important aspect if you are utilizing fluoroscopy uh, uh, frequently with the flexible vitroscopy, so you are working far away from the radiation. On the other hand, also the ergonomic problems. So uh, uh, an important thing, which is the uh, learning curve. If, uh, if we think about, is it complex? It needs a long uh, uh, learning curve. We found that no, any expert with manual urethroscopy after watching uh, a few cases, one or two cases, he can utilize the robot easily. And those for trainees who after trying on animal models or virtual models, after a few cases, four trials, they can reach to the expert level. So the learning curve is not that long or not that complicated. So again, uh, are still any limitation after all these technology, this improvement in all aspects? I can say yes, scope damage is, is, is a, a limiting factor because it adds a cost for that. It can happen due to in instrumentation, as we know, or excessive vending. But recently, as we have the, uh, uh, the single-use uh, flexible urethroscopy, this, it, it avoid the, 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 the uh, concern about the scope damage because it affects really the most important point. It affects the, the education and the training of, uh, of our young uh, uh, residents. If you don't have uh, if you have only expensive tool in your hand, so you can give a chance for that. So with a single use, uh, you can have a, a new one every time in your hand and you can test it and it's easy to, 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 to manipulate uh, uh, and gives you a good clarity of vision and you can do the dusting and you can do the fragmentation, you can extract with the dormia basket, so you can utilize uh, uh, nearly similar to, to the to reusable one, but getting uh, 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 less cost and uh, reduce the, uh, the, the difficulty uh, in front of our young trainee to get the chance to, to, to learn and to manipulate with the uh, uh, flexible retroscope. Uh, so uh, I can conclude that uh, if we review ourselves, complications of urethroscopy are not common. Most of complications are minors. And if we keep in mind the anatomy uh, uh, of the course of the ureter, this will uh, significantly reduce this such complication. And uh, the new development of the scope, it for sure with a smaller size, better clarity of vision will minimize this uh, complication. Uh, we still believe that stool migration and the residual fragments is a significant uh, factor that can affect the stool free rate. And this is the, why the laser companies and the laser technology is running fast to, to, to find a solution to minimize the retrobulsion of the stool. Uh, we believe having all this technology, the robot, new lasers, single use urethroscopy, will improve the efficacy and for sure it will improve the stone free rate. Even it can affect the operative time and reduce it in, in, a, in, in a significant way. It can help us. And this is what we expect in the near future that even the guidelines may move to a larger stone in the favor of flexible retroscopy and uh, uh, have more precise, less retrobulsion will reduce the staged procedure and reduce the professional hazards for exposure to radiation and ergonomics problem. We have always to keep in mind that in each procedure that we have, each technology, we have to keep the balance between risk and benefits, and for sure the cost as well should be considered. Uh, thank you for having me with you today, and uh, it was a great honor for me, and thank you for Kuzin and Professor Lee. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Yas, and uh, thank you for your excellent sharing about the uh, FUS. 
So I I think uh, the future of FUS may be bright and uh, it will never disappear. Maybe in the future, the guideline may have some change and uh, maybe we will treat some larger or compact stone with FUS. Uh, although now the two centimeter is the limitation for FUS technique. But I think with the new laser technique, with the single use technique, and with the robotic assist, and with the finish system, new finish system appear, maybe the FUS will be easier and uh, faster and uh, high efficiency and uh, high clearance rate and uh, less complication. I think many, many things will happen, many, many things will change. But uh, one question for you. So yeah. do you think uh, in future the single use may totally replace the reusable scope in future? Uh, actually, uh, at the current, I will share with you the current concept that we have, that we prefer what's called hybrid technique. Hybrid, it means that you have to keep in your hospital both reusable and single use. The importance of single use that if you have a difficult case, if you have a large stone, if you will, uh, uh, will expect that there will be a strenuous or aggressive movement to your scope so you can utilize the single use. On the other hand, if you, if you are a teaching hospital or if you are a university hospital and you have many fellows or many residents, so single use is very important to help them to gain experience and to help them to improve their learning curve. And uh, keeping the reusable uh, for uh, straightforward cases, uh, so it can be uh, also uh, you can uh, elongate the, uh, the, the life expectancy of the scope. Uh, and one more thing also for the single use, if you have a case of potential infection or especially those uh, HIV or other uh, transmitted infections, so it's not preferred to have the, the reusable. This is what we are doing in the current time. But yes, as you said, we are expecting in the future that uh, single use will be the, the concept for many aspects in the scopes not only in the retroscopy, it can come to the cystoscopy, it can come to the cystonephroscopy, even in other specialities, even in the uh, bronchoscopy or other specialty, because the, the, it, it reduced the cost, it, it relieved the mind from the hassle of cross-infection, contamination, uh, sterilization, so a lot of uh, things, uh, it will be minimized uh, and it will be in the favor of single use. So. I can say our expectation to the future, yes, single use will play a very important uh, uh, part in, in our uh, practice. Yeah, thank you. But uh, I, I think cross infection is the most important thing we're concerned about. And the second thing is money. So first thing is safety of the patient. Yeah. So, uh, Today, uh, Professor Li and Professor Rao, also Professor Liu, will comment you topic. So, any questions from? Uh, okay, so far. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing, Dr. Yasa. Um, I'm T. Rao from uh, Renmin Hospital, Wuhan University. Uh, I think flex, uh, flexible ureteroscopy has a great prospect. Uh, prospect. Uh, but there are still some controversial issues in practice. Um, uh, first question, uh, what is the instant of difficulty in inserting your visual uh, assess sheets in your practice? And what do you do if they are difficult to insert in uh, your visual sheets? And do you use double J tube in advance to improve the success rate of inserting urethral assess sheets. Mm, another question, um, what do you think of the clearance of uh, residual stones after uh, FURS and what can be done to s 
speed up the creation of residual sound. Thank you. Okay. So for the first question, uh, uh, difficult access to the ureter, uh, we have two ways, either to do an active dilatation, which I believe that uh, no one is preferring nowadays to, do, to utilize the balloon or some dilators, uh, or we can do the, the passive dilatation by inserting the double J, which is the common uh, use practice. And even in some centers, they do that routinely before two weeks or uh, 10 days before the rotroscopy, and then patient can come back. But actually, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, in my center, we usually, uh, in 80%, yes, we put double J, but in the uh, last two years, we started to, to have the optical dilatation. So we try to go with the rigid urotroscopy and evaluate the ureter, and if it is easily accessible, there is no stricture or narrowing or significant kinks, this will encourage us to proceed immediately without inserting the double J. So usually in our practice, one of two ways, either to inserting double J from the beginning and coming back after two weeks, or we try now to, to minimize the cost and the multiple sessions of the patient that we can go with the optical dilatation with rigid scope. Uh, and then based on the findings, we can proceed in one session. The second question that you answered regarding to the uh, residual frames, it's the real challenge of flexible urotroscopy that you can get rid of the residual fragments. And here is the, the competition and it, in the technology, uh, as uh, Zahmashid explained, that dusting or super dusting that can help you, to, that you can be confident that you, you will leave the patient even without stent sometimes. Uh, just your uric catheter for 24 hours, and you are confident that the dust will will uh, will uh, be uh, cleared, and uh, to avoid the stool migration. And uh, uh, so this is yes, and this is why till now we don't have a very high uh, uh, stool free rate. Still, we are in average in all publication we are around 80, 85 percent free rate. This is uh, the, 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 the challenge. So uh, uh, sometimes we prefer uh, if we have a hard stone and the dusting is not possible, especially if, you, if your uh, machine is not uh, that uh, super machine to, to give a uh, good dusting. We do fragmentation and the extraction of small fragments uh, with a dormia basket that it will help. You can get rid of the most of the fragments and uh, to avoid uh, large size residual frag. So it's multiple tips and the tricks either based on the technology in your hand, based on the type of the stone, based on the size of the fragments. But I agree with you that it's a challenging point uh, that flexible retroscopy uh, has to find a solution to, to, to grow up in the future and to may have more indication in the field of endurology. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any question from Professor Lilin? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Firstly, I want to thanks to CUA, thanks to Dr. Lee, thanks to Dr. Xu and the other leaders of VOA to organize such a wonderful annual meeting during the, well, this kind of the period so, uh, because of the COVID-19. And uh, secondly, um, it's my pleasure, it's my honor to hear the lectures from Dr. Fairhead and uh, the first lecture from the Dr. Okno. Uh, it's my pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'm really interested uh, in the topic uh, which Dr. Fairhead just uh, presented to us uh, in the very first uh, slide. Uh, Dr. Fairhead has raised a question uh, do we think that it is going up or it declining for the flexible uroscopy? I think uh, uh, Dr. Perry, he has the answer. Um, the flexible uroscopy is going up, but uh, there's still some limitations, um, just uh, as the Dr. Perry raised and talked to us, uh, and uh, we still need to solve these kind of uh, question uh, problems. And uh, I'm really interested in the topic uh, about the robotic assistant uh, uh, flexible because yes, we have the problems 
uh, even I have the problems uh, my son and recently I used to use uh, getting used to use my left hand to hold the handle of the ureteroscopy and in our institution uh, we to get, uh, together with the other university and uh, some kind of the colleagues to invent to uh, develop uh, a uh, robotic system of the uroscopy. Uh, I have one question. Uh, yeah. You know, when we hold the flexible uroscopy, the handle, use my thumb, um, we have the resistance at the tip top of the flexible uroscopy, right? Uh, if we move downwards but the tip, when we have the resistance, it may not go uh, as the same uh, same angle uh, as the uh, in the environment in the experimental uh, environment. So, do you think uh, if the force feedback of the robotic system is necessary for the robotic assistant laboratory rotoscopy? Because we are developing um, a similar kind of the system. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, actually, I don't, uh, I don't I, I, if I were you, I wouldn't give an answer. They would, they're going to develop a robot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we are, we are getting progress together, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. Actually, uh, what we uh, uh, sure that when the, the accuracy, when you move your thumb with mm. the movement of the tip, there mm. is more synchronized uh, or we can say 10 degrees here, it means 13 degrees. So it's almost synchronized, which is different than the manual one. Manual one, you mm -hmm. cannot have this accuracy between the thumb and the tip. Uh, uh, in, in, in the robotic, once you uh, change the, the, the deflection, do the deflection, you, you don't need to press with the thumb. So you can leave everything in position. So it will it will remain as you, as you left. You, you don't need to, 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 to have pressure with your thumb on, on the deflection uh, knob. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the point is the difference between inside the human than in outside, yes, for sure there is a, a difference, but if you are controlling that when you are familiar where the tip of the scope is, it's in the white calyx or in the pelvis or uh, in a narrow space, so it, it make a difference uh, uh, based on the orientation of uh, the anatomy of the Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Dr. Yeah. So uh, next will be Professor Liu. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, next, okay. uh, Professor Yasa. Uh, I have a small question for you. In, in fact, in recent years, some new concept of surgery had been introduced uh, uh, in the treatment for complicated renal stones. For example, the combined endoscopic surgery uh, in, due, uh, in, this, uh, in this procedures, uh, the flexible uroscopy and the percutaneous approach uh, was performed in the same time. And some study have showed good outcomes and some studies uh, believe that um, this uh, this technique will bring about a promising future for complicated stones uh, especially for uh, stacks horn stones uh, what's your opinion thank you uh, actually the combined technique yes it it's growing also uh, very well uh, it can help to to uh, to, to go for a complicated or complex stones. And uh, the combination between the mini Burke and the flexible retroscopy, this is the, the common era nowadays that you combine both of them for large size stones or uh, multiple uh, calicial stone instead of having multiple uh, functions with BCNL. So the combined, it will, uh, it will take a part, a significant part in such cases. Uh, this is what we see nowadays, and we are expecting it will grow more and more in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yasa, and thank you, Dr. Zam. Uh, although very late, maybe midnight in U.S. and uh, very earlier yeah. uh, in <laughs> Dubai, but. Uh, Thank you very much for participating in our meeting. 
uh, okay. we have we have many many questions, but uh, this is a new meeting for the ULSS group, so we have to move on. And thank you again. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Thank you. And, thank you and uh, all you. the best. Yeah. See you. Nice to see you offline one day. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Especially uh, in Russia, next time. <laughs> And uh, also yep. in Dubai next, I say uh, in Dubai next year. So yes, are you yes? Thank yeah, you. yeah. Next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And bye. Thank have you very much. Have yeah. a successful event. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.